Denmark's centre-left politicians regain power by making a right-hand turn on immigration. Do the Social Democrats have a plan for handling the crisis? Or are they playing politics through fear-mongering? I'm Imran Garda and today's newsmaker is Denmark's elections. Danish opposition leader Met Fredriksen found a winning formula on the campaign trail promote social welfare issues while borrowing from the far right's playbook against refugees. Just listen to her victory speech after last week's parliamentary elections. During her flurry of promises to help the environment and the poor, she reaffirmed a stance being adopted across Europe, that the state has to crack down on immigrants if it wants to continue providing for its own people. So is this the way liberal parties are trying to weather a populist storm? Or has the anti-immigration agenda of fringe groups now become Europe's new mainstream? Francis Collins has this report from Denmark. It's a bleak location, especially in deepest winter when we visited. The island of Lindholm, four kilometers off the southern coast of Denmark, is a symbol of the current attitude to refugees and asylum seekers here. This former research center for infectious diseases is where the government wants to place asylum seekers who've been convicted of a crime but can't be sent home. Despite a liberal reputation politically, Denmark now has some of the most aggressive anti-immigrant policies in Europe. A new refugee and asylum bill passed in February by the then centre-right coalition government of Lars Luke Rasmussen was called a paradigm shift. It moved focus away from integration of asylum seekers to the possible repatriation of people seeking refuge in Denmark. It could also affect those who are already here. Dejeni Daba arrived four years ago from Ethiopia. Studying for a computing degree, he's now married and has a daughter. But he knows at any stage he could be deported. Every day they are changing so many rules, which is almost impossible for asylum seekers. It's difficult to expect really something good. But anyways, I have to be here because I have also family. So there is something really like I'm worried about, like to leave my family or... So yeah, I have a big fear. For those who work with migrants and refugees on a daily basis, helping them to assimilate, these are difficult times. The climate for asylum seekers is one of fear. Whenever you are uh, uh, searching a job, you have to go to the municipality and to the job center. And the job center, they have to tell you, have you thought about going home? I mean, there's no reason you should stay here anymore. You should, you know, so they are constantly forcing the caseworkers to use language that makes people feel unwelcome. It's not difficult to see why this country is often voted by the United Nations as one of the best places in the world to live. Less so if you are an asylum seeker. The Social Democrats won last week's election here in Denmark, but they were taking policies on immigration from the far right. It does seem in this country that anti-immigration rhetoric has become normalized. The last government, led by Rasmussen, needed to be propped up by the right-wing Danish People's Party after the 2015 election. Its influence soon became clear, especially with regards to immigration. When the plan for Lindholm Island was announced, the party put out a tweet with the words, expelled criminal aliens have nothing to do with Denmark. But it wasn't the only one offering support to the government. The winner of the election last week was the Social Democrats. Their leader and expected next Prime Minister Mette Frederiksen supported this and other hardline measures against asylum seekers. They had policies on welfare and the environment that were in keeping with the party's history, but not on immigration. The change seemed to strike a chord with the voters. Four years ago, the Social Democrats lost power and lost support that went to the parties of the right a defeat that was avenged last week. It also made Frederiksen the face of a new breed of center-left politicians. We have 
i fællesskab et håb om, at vi kan forandre Danmark, at vi kan forbedre Danmark. Det er en historisk stor sejr. The election appeared to be generally welcomed, but with reservations. I'm happy, but also a bit in a, a dilemma, because I want a new direction for Denmark, especially concerning refugees and immigrants and how we welcome them to our countries and make sure that Denmark is an, an open society for everybody. In much the same way that environmental policies are now expressed by all parties, so are concerns about refugees. There is a sense that politicians on this issue are playing catch-up. This is a topic where there's generally been I think it's fair to say more of a, like a divide between the general public, the voters and, and the parties in general. And, or the, at least the, the right-wing parties have been uh, more in sync with, uh, with voters in general. It's, it turns out that actually voters are very divided on this issue, but I think it's, a, it's sort of a commonsensical un understanding that the, the right-wing the, the right parties have catered more to, to voters on this issue. The Social Democrats' policy of staying tough on immigration while being true to their traditional beliefs elsewhere, could be a model for the centre-left across Europe. It may be unpalatable to many, but Denmark may have shown an effective way that far-right parties can be defeated at the ballot box. Francis Collings, The Newsmakers. Let's go to our panel in Denmark. In Copenhagen is lawyer Tariq Ziad Hussein, who wrote The Black Beard about being a Danish Muslim. Also in Copenhagen is journalist Tom Carstensen and Susie Merritt is an associate professor in the Department of Culture and Global Studies at Aalborg University. I thank you all for joining us on the Newsmakers. Tarek, let me start with you. Did the centre-left win because they chose an anti-immigration platform? I think that's a great question. Um, in Denmark, we have since the year of 2001 had a very harsh uh, discussion regarding uh, Muslims and uh, immigration and integration in general. And for most of us, we thought that there was no limits for uh, the things that you could say and the things that the politicians uh, could propose. But one of the new dynamics of this election was the party of Stram Kurs with Rasmus Paludan, as some of you may have seen on YouTube, who has gotten famous for burning the Quran in some of the areas where there's a lot of immigrants. And suddenly, for the first time, I think in 20 years, we had most of the political parties in Denmark defending the rights of Muslims and their right to have their religion in peace, but at the same time without uh, giving up uh, the right to criticize some of the issues that there definitely is within the Muslim community. Um, so I think it's too easy to say that this was the only reason that the left-wing parties won the election, but it's definitely one of the reasons. Okay, Susie, let me ask it to you in a different way. So you have the far-right parties saying Muslims are bad, Islam is evil, immigrants are going to harm you, and so on. That doesn't resonate with the majority of Danish people. But the center-left's argument is you might lose your welfare benefits and you might lose the lifestyle that you have and we've already seen austerity, if we allow in more immigrants. So they're not saying anything overtly negative about Muslims or other immigrants, but that seems to have done the trick. Is that an accurate characterization by me of the messaging from the centre-left? Partly, I would say, in the sense that it helped uh, to also combine welfare issues, uh, which are, of course, important, and uh, particularly when these welfare issues are so... Uh, um, let's say, translated into uh, welfare, nationalistic welfare chauvinist so, uh, issues uh, in the sense of uh, creating so this uh, relationship in between so welfare state and so uh, immigration. But there's no doubt actually that uh, since at least 2015, the social democrats have uh, significantly changed their own politics as concerns uh, both uh, immigration broadly uh, understood and also asylum politics. So they have moved uh, in from an, a position that could be described as uh, integrational in the sense of uh, giving more um, emphasis on uh, the integration of both migrants and refugees towards a position of uh, so um, sending people back, particularly as regards so the uh, asylum seekers and refugees that have come to the country lately. Okay, so Tom, addressing the issue of welfare through the prism of immigration, was that the magic formula for the centre-left? 
Well, the Social Democrats didn't, in fact, get more votes than last time. Uh, they got about the same, a bit less, actually. Um, so, I mean, the Social Democrats have moved. They have the new generation of politicians, basically. The old ones called the Danish People's Party, which was the first big right-wing party in Denmark. They, they called them uh, very right-wing. They said they would never be a, a proper party. This new generation, they're a lot younger. Um, they have changed. They, well, they've changed the party in general. They are saying things that... The, the Danish People's Party said 10 years ago. You can't really, if you look at old quotes from Danish People's Party from then and young social democrats now, it's hard to tell the difference. Right, so do you believe that they've been dragged to the right? And if so, by what? So you could say they've been dragged to the right. You could say they have changed their mind because there are issues in Denmark that needs resolving. That's what they would say themselves. Uh, I mean, the integration... A uh, spokesperson, is he's, his father was from uh, Somalia, as far as I remember, and he, he lives in one of the areas that where, where, where there are many people from Muslim countries, and he has these feelings, even though he's half, he's half immigrant. So right. I, he, you have to ask himself why, why they did it. Okay, so Tariq, this is interesting, right? So you have somebody who is originally from Somalia um, pushing for an anti-immigrant platform. According to the best of available evidence that I have, more immigrants voted than ever before in this election. So you have all of that, and they're voting for less yeah. immigration. It's democracy. That's what they want. Tell me your thoughts on that. So that's actually very interesting because, as we've seen in Denmark for the last many elections, the amount of people who vote in immigrant in integrate in uh, sorry in immigrant areas are much lower than amongst uh, Danish citizens. So in this ele election, we've seen what I've called almost an, a revolution uh, when we see how people have mobilized in these areas to make sure that some of the most extreme right wing parties don't get into parliament. But just to give you an example of how harsh the tone regarding uh, Muslim in Denmark is one of the biggest newspapers today in Denmark called Jyllands Posten. They had a front page where they problematized that uh, many more Muslims were voting for this election uh, and that the imams in the mosque were going out and saying to people, remember to vote. And of course, saying, remember to vote on the parties that want to ensure that your freedoms and your rights will be maintained and, in, and uh, secured here in Denmark. So it's amazing how such a positive story you would think could be laid out as being something horrible that the Danish people should be afraid of. So many Muslims feel that they are uh, in some kind of catch-22 situation because when we don't vote, we are told that we don't engage in democracy. And on the other hand, when we go out and vote, we are told that that's also a problem, which it's a great example of how the debate regarding Muslims have been in Denmark since 2001. Susie, is there a harsh tone? Yes, I believe so. I mean, um, we've been conducting interviews with uh, politicians at different levels, uh, both at national level and local level. And we have observed that, particularly uh, when it comes to uh, Muslim minorities, uh, the Muslim community, the tone and particularly the discourse is harsh, but not only amongst so-called uh, radical right uh, populists or right-wing populists, but also amongst other let's say, more mainstream parties. So there's certainly something to discuss about, something that uh, needs to be uh, also uh, bring to dialogue. And particularly, I think that uh, the uh, Muslim communities are unheard as concerned several different things, which is not only, let's say, the, um, uh, the, the tone of the debate when it comes to migration and asylum issues, but also when it comes to, for example, deciding where to displace people uh, as regards to urban planning, the so-called ghetto plan that has been so implemented recently in different so major Danish cities. So I, I think that, uh, and, and hopefully, so the uh, new government will take this issue up, also discussing so aspects that relate right. to uh, Islamophobic so uh, positions, yes. Yeah. And on the fringes, Tom Carstensen, so the far-right DPP, the Danish People's Party, from more than 20% to less than 10% now of support. The anti-Islam party hardline didn't even get the 2% threshold. What does that tell us about the Danish people's feelings towards those on the edges of the right-wing spectrum? Well, firstly, I think it's important to, to differentiate here because I don't see Danish People's Party as a far-right party, not with the parties I work with. They are, in many ways, a social democratic party with a very staunch, very hard, you could call, immigration policy. They are very close to the Danish social democrats now on, on a lot of policies. It's just very important for me to differentiate. Okay. Far-right is, to me, something else. 
That would be Islam Kuas, for instance. He's far right. He didn't get in, though. He lost by 0.2, I think. And speaking of the tone, of course, that was he was he's extreme in his way of saying things and his things he does. And pretty much anybody else completely distanced himself to him. Uh, you also have another party called New Bali that came in. They're not a libertarian and on most policies, and then they are hard right on, on immigration. They just got in among, above the threshold. So, it, it, I mean, it's... It, Danish People's Party have been slaughtered in this election, of course, but I think that has a lot to do with the fact that the, that Social Democrats have taken over so many policies that they have basically it been such a big success to the so that it's a problem for themselves. Yeah, just one small point regarding the Danish People's Party, because one of the other big reasons I think that they lost this election is that they got famous for being an anti-establishment party. And for the last four years, they have shown that they have become a part of the establishment and therefore lost a lot of votes to the other parties. Got it, got it. And so when we look at the Liberals, as they do their, their soul-searching, when Lars Lok Rasmussen and the Liberals try to figure out where they went wrong, if you had to identify one thing, Tariq, what would that be? I think that's my personal analysis, that one of the things that we lack in the Danish uh, uh, political system is, and probably it's a problem all over the world, that there's a lack of ideology. And in Denmark, the differences between uh, the Social Democrats and the Liberals, who are the two main parties that deliver all the governments, they are very, very small. And at the end of the day, if the, you put them together, they would probably agree on almost everything. That's also why Lars Lüge Rasmussen, at the end of the uh, election cycle, tried to propose that uh, to engage in a government with the Social Democrats, which is a great symbol of uh, how small the differences actually are at the end of the day. Susie Merritt, as we look across the continent, would others across the continent be looking at the Danish example and try copycat approaches? Because they're looking at populism, they're looking at the right wing. It's either those on the fringes of the right or the Greens and those on the fringes of the left that seem to be doing well. The center seems to be hollowed out. But the center left comes out in Denmark and wins, and it says some of the things that the working class generally resonates with that usually goes towards the right. They got those votes. Would others be looking at Denmark and say, maybe we're, we can follow this narrative as well? Well, of course, there's a lot of uh, interest. And uh, already, I mean, uh, now also before the elections, uh, so uh, social democrats from Germany uh, were in contact with uh, also several so academics which uh, who have been uh, studying this, uh, this uh, field of, uh, of uh, politics uh, for, for a long time. And I think that uh, the interest is uh, precisely as to what Rick was uh, mentioning in the sense of uh, the ideolo ideology that is in a little bit like dissolved or disappearing uh, both on the center left and on the center right. Uh, because, I mean, co-opting politics from other parties, of course, uh, so uh, dilutes very much what were, what were some uh, kind of uh, ideological pinpoints of, uh, of the party. And this is what, let's say, it's a consequence of uh, getting towards the middle and trying to win and maximize votes uh, towards the middle, which might be very problematic. And I would say not only for the Social Democrats uh, in, in, in a way, but also in, in, in this case for uh, the Danish People's Party, uh, which is a party that uh, obviously during these elections has lost a little bit of the issue, so importance uh, that was... Uh, um, predominantly, so the migration and the uh, the asylum issue. So it's very interesting to see, uh, let's say, the next steps. Not only right. the government formation from the side of the Social Democrats, but also uh, the reactions from yeah. the Danish People's Party. Okay, Tariq. So very finally from you, because we're running out of time. Just, if yeah, this just is one going small to point. So, j j just one yeah, second, Tariq, fold, fold in your response to this, right? If this is going to be a winning formula across the continent, right, where those in the center, whether center right or center left, decide, hey, we can be maybe more anti-immigrant in order to come to power because they failed over the past few years. Yeah. What is this going to mean for immigration across the continent, Tariq? Again, that's a great question because Denmark was probably one of the first European countries that had a very harsh line regarding immigration back in 2001. And therefore, it's interesting to see if uh, the way that this election has been laid out will also be projected over at other countries in Europe. Um, I think that the Social Democrats' logic was that we will be very harsh on integration, and in that way, we will secure the votes from the Danish People's Party. And on the other hand, that means that we will lose some of the leftist votes in our own parties, but those votes will go to the leftist parties that will support us anyway. 
And therefore, you could say in many ways that the logic and the uh, plan of the Social Democrats has been a great success if you compare uh, their uh, amount of votes that they got in this election compared with Social Democrats all over Europe. Tariq Ziad Hussain, Tom Carstensen, and Susie Merritt, I thank you all for joining us on The Newsmakers. Coming up on the program, as Israel gears up for snap elections, we ask whether the Prime Minister's political future is in doubt. And facing the fallout, we look at why the Kremlin is so upset at HBO for its widely popular miniseries about the Chernobyl nuclear disaster. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu was on his way to a historic fifth term after his Likud party's election victory in April. But then came the political monkey wrench. A disagreement over Orthodox Jews serving in the army doomed Netanyahu's hopes for a coalition between the religious far-right and the far-right secularists. Now the country faces a redo election later this year. All while there are questions over whether Netanyahu who's likely to be indicted on corruption charges, will be ousted as party leader. Matthew Pohonen reports. From the bright lights of election night to the dissolution of parliament. The past few weeks have been bruising for Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. In April, his party, Likud, won the largest share of votes but not enough to form a majority in the Knesset. Netanyahu was given 42 days to form a governing coalition, negotiating with parties on the right, from secularists to the religious. But ultimately, he couldn't forge a middle ground on a critical issue. Ultra-Orthodox Jewish parties wanted religious students exempted from mandatory military service. The ultra-nationalist secular party Israel Betinu, led by former Defence Minister Avigdor Lieberman, didn't. It was a political impasse Netanyahu couldn't manoeuvre around. But instead of giving the opposition a chance to try to form a government, he stopped them by using his numbers in the Knesset to dissolve parliament. Israel is now headed for snap elections in September. The Prime Minister has pointed the finger of blame at Lieberman for this second trip to the polls. Likud has failed in this task to form a coalition, to form a government. Together with their turn to the ultra-Orthodox, they fully bear responsibility for the fact that Israel is now going back once again to election. Netanyahu will need the support of conservative right-wing parties if Likud gets another turn to try to form government. No one party has ever been able to govern Israel on its own. But first, Netanyahu will have to convince voters to back him again. While Israel is in a period of political turmoil, the Prime Minister himself has also come under personal scrutiny. In October, he'll face a pretrial hearing into corruption allegations. Indictments could come after that. Netanyahu denies any wrongdoing, accusing his opponents of a witch hunt. In July, he'll become Israel's longest-serving Prime Minister. But will he be in pole position to extend his record beyond the next vote? Natalie Pohonen, The Newsmakers. Let's bring in our guests now. In Tel Aviv, we have Alon Tal, who ran for parliament under Benny Gantz's Israel Resilience Party. That's a part of the opposition Blue and White Alliance. He's likely to run again in September's vote. In West Jerusalem is Rachel Broyd. She ran the Likud Party's outreach program for English speakers. 
And Ron Campius joins us from Washington, D.C. He's a bureau chief at the Jewish Telegraphic Agency. I thank you all for joining us on the Newsmakers. Rachel, let me start with you, especially from Likud's perspective. I'm fascinated to hear what you have to say. The Prime Minister, Netanyahu, failed to form a coalition government and is mired in scandal. Is Benjamin Netanyahu still really fit to be Prime Minister of Israel? So first of all, thank you for having me. And to answer your question, yes. Look, the people of Israel have continuously voted for a right-wing government. They clearly want Prime Minister Netanyahu to continue. And I think that, you know, the right-wing coalition partners that recommended Netanyahu did so because that's what their supporters wanted and that's what they were voted in to do. So the short answer is yes. I think he is very much still fit to be the prime minister. Alon Tal, even though you're on the other side of this, and this is perhaps an opportunity for your side when it comes to another election, do you have sympathy for the man that in trying to put together this coalition, the, the square pegs were just too square and the round holes were just too round, and it was just ultimately an impossibility for him? Well, it was an impossibility for him because there's a myth that the vast majority of Israelis want him to be prime minister. There's, Israel's a very, very divided and complicated society. But what we learned in the last uh, six weeks is, is that Benjamin Netanyahu did not win the last election, that he did not have 61 majority members of parliament to support his government. And so we're going back to the people of Israel. And I believe the next time around, when, we, when the public of Israel really takes a look at the number of lies that were told in the previous election, the prime minister's unparalleled uh, in, intention to dismantle the fundamental uh, agencies and institutions that support the rule of law in Israel and democracy, and mostly the fact that he's indicted, or he's supposed to be indicted, on three different counts of, of corruption charges. I think these together will change the outcome and will bring to a, a new government within Israel. And we'll get a response from Rachel in a moment. But Ron, has the prime minister been fiddling with the democracy, as, as has been suggested by Alon? I think that's uh, that's the perception, that's the narrative. I think that Alon's party is going to want to advance as the uh, as the next election gets near. I think it was in 2015 elections that Netanyahu ran the the famous babysitter ad, in which he was presented and he was able to successfully present himself as the the adult in the room, the person who was able to bring everybody together and protect Israel. Uh, I think he's been wounded. He's uh, his uh, by the recent events. He can't put together a government and for the first time I think he's perceived as being out for more for his own interests uh, than he is for the nation's interests. Rachel Broyd? So first of all, I, I, I don't believe that the results will be that drastic. I think when you look at the polls that are coming out now, the main parties that are injured are those on the left, not on the right. Um, you know, blue and white suffers some hits in the recent polls. Labor might be wiped off the map altogether. And in recent polls, Likud has only gone up in numbers. Um, not down. And I think, <clears throat> excuse me, um, and I think regarding the allegation that the prime minister is trying to dismantle democracy is just, it's just ridiculous. Yair Lapid up to, you know, even a year ago supported judicial reform. Everybody knows that there is judicial activism in Israel. It's not a secret. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, the Supreme Court can't be the players, the coaches, and the referees in the same match. Okay, but and okay. I think that's really okay, what the debate is here. R Rachel, what's, address what's, this point. So, certainly, address the point that the prime minister, in trying to cobble together a coalition, was making promises to everyone in order to get their support to support a bill that would give him immunity from corruption charges. You see how that looks from the outside, don't you? I I, I do understand how it how it looks on on, on the outside, and I. I'm very uh, receptive to that feeling in the in the public in the public image. However, we have to remember that Israel already has immunity for for MKs, and the bill that was being proposed in Israel was the bill was the status quo in Israel until up about well, around a decade ago, even a little bit less. And it's a model that's very common in European countries. In fact, Yair Lapid, who was the co-chairman of Blue and White, actually supported an even more extreme bill, which is the French model, which is that you can't even. You can't even investigate uh, sitting members of parliament, which is not the model that was being presented in, in Israel and was not the, the bill. Um, and so I find it actually ironic that many members of now the opposition supported a bill when it was convenient for them to support it, and now when it's not popular for them to support it, so they don't support it. But I don't think it has any, I don't think it's actually about democracy or 
or anything. I think it's purely about they want they don't want prime minister to be the prime minister and they want Netanyahu out and it's this anybody but BB campaign. Alon, are you guys just a bunch of hypocrites? Well, first of all, I think that her misrepresentation of Yerla Lapid is is fairly uh, well. It's fairly uh, obvious and scandalous. But let's let's uh, return to the previous election when Prime Minister Netanyahu promised the voters that when he, if elected, he would do nothing to enhance or change the status of immunity. This is after our Attorney General came forward with with really three very very clear four uh, cases of where we feel that he's violated the law and uh, violated cor corruption uh, by, uh, charges. And so for him now to spend so much political capital and try to bribe so many political parties in order to preserve that immunity situation is, is really, uh, it's disingenuous to argue that, uh, that, that, it's, uh, that it's legitimate. I just want to make a couple of other points that I think one of the biggest differences between uh, the blue and white party and the, that is the major challenger, and which is running more or less head in head with the Likud, is that we're reaching out to try to uh, bring in all aspects of Israeli society and to legitimize all we have people on the right and left. We're a centrist party, which realizes the polarization, which has really unfortunately characterized so much of the political discourse, is, is disastrous. In a country which has such security it challenges, we must be united. And unfortunately, Prime Minister Netanyahu has been a force for polarization, for extremism, for embracing radical, religious, and racist elements and legitimizing them, bring them into the mainstream. These are things which I think have crossed certain red lines, and we're hoping that in our next election, where we, as a brand new party last time, were unable to convince the majority of the public, we're hoping this time that we're going to bring over the vast majority of Israeli voters. Rachel, Netanyahu has empowered the radicals and the racists. I find that ironic for a party that recently just held a rally where it brought in you know, the Arab nationalists uh, to, to their rally to be claiming that, they're, that the Likud is uh, supporting extremists and creating just division for the sake of division. At the end of the day, there is no such thing as just centrist in Israel. Blue and white is, is incohesive. Their platform is incohesive. They have people who support a two-state solution, people who don't support a two-state solution. They have the original author of the nation-state bill saying that it won't be changed. Then they have Yair Lapid saying, just on Twitter today, it will be changed. You know, trying to get a mishmash of everybody doesn't make you cohesive. It just makes you a mess. So it's it's possible that they'll bring in other other people, and it's possible that they won't. I think that a lot of people are starting to see that blue and white is not as cohesive as it was presented during the time of the elections. And I think that, as we saw from their rally, as we saw from the members of their own party that boycotted that rally, that it's not they're not as peace and love and kumbaya as they're making this them, them, themselves out to be. Uh, I'm going to get well, a I okay. I Go ahead. Go ahead, Alon. I, I attended this rally, and I think it's outrageous. I mean, 20% of Israelis are Arabs, and they vote for political parties, and I don't agree with many of their positions, but disqualify 20% of the, uh, the citizens of Israel and the right of their leaders to appear in a public demonstration that favors democracy seems to me to be really uh, way over the line. I mean, let's remember there's a difference between the members of uh, the far-right parties that have a photograph in the living room of Baruch Goldstein, a man who murdered in cold blood dozens of Palestinians because they are Arab, and a, uh, and a political party with whom I don't necessarily agree, but calls for nonviolence, and at the rally spoke extremely, extremely uh, enthusiastically about working I mean, together and creating a consensus of society. There, there, are members, there are members of the Arab parties that were that were political advisors to Yasser Arafat. Give me a break that they're just, you know, peace, love, and everything is about peaceful resistance. It's not. When you read their tweets, the what, what the Arab parties in Israel are fighting for is Arab nationalism, and they're not fighting for a two-state two solution or a peaceful interaction between, uh, you know, the, the Palestinians and the Israelis. They're fighting for a Palestinian nationalism. That's what they say. It's in their platform. So I think and, that and, I don't and, agree with Otsma. I didn't vote for them. No, I just was going to say that we need okay, an Israel I don't, to... I don't uh, believe it brings together. people together. I think that you need to have a, a chance, red line. You guys, listen, there's, a, there's like a, a two-second delay between the two of you. So, Alon, go ahead. Rachel, give him a chance. I was just going to say that it's important that we leave a place at the table for Israeli Arab citizens. And what Likud is saying by delegitimizing anybody who is non-Jewish to say... Uh, they don't have a place at the table. I think that's not the way that we're going to move forward as a society. And if you actually listen to what uh, Eamon Uda said, he wasn't talking about delegitimizing. He said, we can't do it without the Jews. Let's work together. So yes, I agree. And I'm delighted to hear a Likud spokeswoman talking in favor of a two-state solution, which incidentally 
the blue and white party is in favor of a uh, what we call a disconnecting from from the West Bank. So I don't think that we have the actual uh, map that we need to draw yet, but I think we have a consensus, and it's certainly not the kind of extremism which has been uh, favored, uh, supported by so many of the Likud partners so, in okay. the negotiation. And, and as we talk about the status um, of I, the... Can I, okay. can I respond? So, Sandy, Rachel, just a second, right? I want to bring Ron in here. Ron, we're not ignoring you, but I just want to sort of... I want to broaden this out a little bit because we, we were speaking about the status of the Arab Israelis, the Arab citizens of Israel, and I wonder, as we look at this election that was and the coalition that never was and the new election to come and efforts in Washington and elsewhere at bringing a peaceful solution between the Israelis and the Palestinians who live under occupation in the West Bank and in Gaza, those other Arabs, those other Palestinians, are we just going to see more and more of the status quo now when it comes to those big fundamental questions with regards to Israel and its neighbors? Yeah, I don't think that uh, that the status quo is going to get shaken up much. I, I think that uh, uh, the, the two-state solution is uh, is uh, uh, is still is still stuck in uh, in neutral. But then so is any other uh, solution that uh, that anybody's proposing. We don't know yet what the uh, what the Jared Kushner plan looks like, but it looks increasingly like it's uh, heavily reliant on uh, economic uh, development for the Palestinians. And the Palestinians are already saying, and, and some Arabs are also saying, even in Saudi Arabia, that absent a, uh, a national solution as well, it's a non-starter. So yeah, th th things as far as that go, uh, they're, they're remaining. Right now, I think that this election is focused much more internally on resolving things among Israelis themselves, including uh, uh, Arab Israelis uh, like those uh, represented by Ayman Ode. And I think what's, what's interesting, one, one interesting development is that you're uh, is that the uh, Arab parties lost seat in the, seats in the last election because they were bickering, and now they're coming back around uh, to to, uh, to a unified ticket ahead of this election, uh, where they might regain the, uh, you know, go go back up to 13 th seats, which is what they had in the uh, in the last Knesset. Rachel, you want to come in? Sure. There are, of course, I mean, 20 percent of Israel are. Arabs, and it's important that they have representation, but they need to be looking out for the Arab-Israeli interests and not the Palestinian interests, and they're not the same. And when you have Palestinian nationalistic members of parliament who, <clears throat> who don't acknowledge Israel's right to exist, who have um, supported terrorists, who were smuggling uh, cell phones to terrorists in prisons, it's hard to then come along afterwards and say they just want, you know, they just want representation, they just want a seat at the table, because they don't want to be at the table. I think that's the first one, and I think I, I agree that, you know, we don't exactly know what the, quote, deal of the century is, and I think that, um, you know, the Palestinians have been offered a two-state solution up until now, and it's important to remember that they have declined every offer that they have received. So maybe it's time to shake things up a bit, and it's it's time that we discuss other other potential solutions. And that is isn't that is an important variable, and I do think that President Trump understands that, and I think that the Prime Minister very much understands that, and that's why it's been a big focus of his that, you know, for the sake of Israel's security, that we discuss other potential solutions. Alon, and you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but what's fascinating is the way Rachel has characterized the Arab nationalist parties, as, as she's put it, right, is very similar to how Avigdor Lieberman has characterized them in the past. Of course, he's... Um, been squared off against Prime Minister Netanyahu when it comes to the aftermath of these elections. Now, those two are going head to head. Netanyahu blames Lieberman for all his coalition problems and his failure to put together a coalition. Where's that fight going to go now? And was, what does it tell us about the very question of Israeli identity? Well, I think, first of all, uh, it shows, I think, that many people on the right who voted for Bibi Netanyahu, and uh, the recent polls suggest, uh, will vote for Lieberman because there was a willingness on the part of Netanyahu to make very, very large concessions to the ultra-Orthodox parties. We just recently heard news that they agreed in certain cities to allow for separation, uh, gender-based, on the sexes. That was part of the agreement. We had uh, agreements that would have uh, increased the spending for ultra-Orthodox separate uh, religious institutions, and at, at a time when our country is at a has a 20 billion shekel deficit. We know we're going to have very, very draconian cutbacks. The prime minister did all that. And I think that it, uh, Lieberman, I think, did uh, something that we is certainly uh, saluted him, which was saying, no, there's a limit. Our party also has called for a change, greater religious freedom in Israel, 
There's no reason why secular communities shouldn't be able to have free public, uh, public transportation on the Sabbath. There's no reason why we shouldn't have a much more uh, conciliatory way to get married if you're not meeting ultra-Orthodox uh, standards. And so this is a national uh, consensus. And I think what it means in the next election is that it'll be much easier for our party to work with uh, Lieberman and find common ground and form the next government. Lieberman has said that he's not certain he will be recommending Netanyahu in the next uh, election. That's, of course, good news for us. I just want to say one more thing, right. if I might, about the rule of law in Israel, because it's so important. What has distinguished Israel from all the other countries in the Middle East is the fact that we are a democratic nation. And one of the reasons we stay democratic is by having a robust and activist Supreme Court, a Supreme Court that undertakes judicial review, something that I'm very proud of and something which has often ruled against my own personal uh, pre preferences. But I know how important it is to have the rights of the minority protected. And the fact that this prime minister was willing to allow extremist elements to try to strip those authorities from our Supreme Court is extremely worrying. Alon Sal, Rachel Broyd, and Ron Campius. I'm out of time. I'm going to move on. But it's been good to have you on the program. Thanks for joining us. That is how an RBMK reactor core explodes. Lies. Valery Legasov is portrayed as a hero in HBO's new blockbuster miniseries Chernobyl. It shows the nuclear physicist standing up against the Soviet cover-up, possibly saving a countless number of lives after the 1986 nuclear meltdown. But while Chernobyl has been a hit with both Americans and Russians, the program is not so popular with the Kremlin. Russian officials say Chernobyl is a propaganda hit piece and a pro-government television network is producing its own show, which partly blames the disaster on the CIA. Well, to discuss this, I'm joined in Moscow by Dmitry Medvedenko. He's a journalist at the Russian news agency TASS, and in Northampton, Massachusetts, is historian Jennifer Eremieva. She wrote the books, Have Personality Disorder, Will Rule Russia, and Lenin Lives Next Door. Good to have you both on the program. Uh, Dmitry, I, I watched Chernobyl. I was blown away by how well it was done. It was fantastic. Um, I wonder, was it true to the spirit of the tragedy, to the history, the events, or was it all of that, but also a little bit anti-Russian? What do you think? Um, my, my general perception of the series was that it was, it was brilliant. I mean, there were a few cringeworthy moments, like uh, people drinking vodka at the hotel or the soldiers drinking vodka, given that there was prohibition law enforced at the time. And uh, actually, the accounts of the uh, liquidators or the responders was that they, they did have the vodka, but it was, uh, it was uh, moonshine from far away uh, deserted villages, for example. But otherwise, let's just go back to, to the general impression. I think it was very well done. My first uh, thought uh, when I watched episode one is that why hasn't Russia done its own mm. movie, uh, its own big uh, blockbuster series on, on the topic? Uh, and even though there were a few uh, feature-length movies and countless documentaries, of course, on the topic, the general impressions that HBO has really kind of placed Chernobyl on, on the map now, right. again, 33 years later. And Jennifer, is that what is rubbing some officials up the wrong way to the extent um, to which they, they're actually going at NTV, going to create their own series where they're going to suggest that the CIA was maybe involved? Is that at the heart of it, that... How come we didn't do it? How come HBO and Sky did it? And it's all these people with, with English accents. We should have been the ones to do this. Well, I applaud NTV for um, making the effort to put together a, a show about Chernobyl. I think it's long overdue. It, HBO is going to be a very hard act to follow. Um, the series was um, a spectacular hit here in the United States and in, in Europe. And my understanding is that it's playing extremely well in Russia as well. I've heard, I've heard about places where there are obscure monuments to the Chernobyl liquidators that had never had any interest uh, taken in them before. And now people are going to lay flowers. So. Uh, I think that it's all to the good to bring uh, ideas like this to the fore. Right. And talking about ideas like this coming to the fore, Dimitri, looking back at the system that was Soviet communism, that comes under the spotlight. Now, whether 
this is something that's a parallel with, with all other systems that eventually just uh, survive only to sustain themselves and operate only to sustain themselves, or it was something particular to, to communism. Tell me what it would mean for Russians to watch characters such as the Paul Ritter character, Anatoly Dyatlov, where you have this kind of uh, knucklehead bureaucrat who punches down at, at inferiors and kisses up or kisses ass when it comes to superiors and only exists to perpetuate his own job and, and to survive in a system of lies. So beyond the nuclear tragedy, tell me what, what that sort of character and that kind of culture of lies means for Russians when they watch this show. Oh, he was one of the most horrifying elements of the whole story, I think. I think um, episode one really strikes a chord when it's like a horror movie, where you're watching uh, not just a horrible uh, technogenic disaster uh, unfold, but also the way it is dealt uh, with just complete denial from, from uh, Dyatlov when he's just basically saying, no, that's impossible, the reactor couldn't, couldn't explode. And if you actually rewatch um, interviews with him, there's an unknown interview which was posted on YouTube a few years ago with him, where he, uh, um, it, it was before he died, I think in 1995, but uh, he still continues to deny any wrongdoing in the whole situation. He says it's uh, still something which was uh, as a result of the technical characteristics of the reactor, and he had basically nothing to do with it. So even though, of course, we understand that in a series you have these characters which are based on, on true uh, personalities, sometimes they're a collective personality, like mm -hmm. Uliana Khamyuk. She represented all of the researchers and scientists who helped Legasov. He wasn't a one-man scientific force dealing with uh, the disaster. Uh, Dyatlov here does, in fact, represent uh, the lack of uh, feeling of responsibility that was uh, true to uh, the way the Soviet system worked, where basically, in order to achieve greatness, achieve results, you needed to step away from the official safety regulation papers. So right. you needed to improvise and show initiative, which he does, and which leads in eventually to the, to the disaster. But when you are blamed for it, you basically are shown the instruction and that you didn't follow it. And so it creates this kind of logical loop. And he takes zero responsibility. So this is one of the most terrifying elements of the series, in my, in my opinion. But I wanted to go back to, to the whole NTV story. Uh, my, uh, my opinion was, my, my per perception of this whole NTV is also making their own Chernobyl was just exactly as yours and, and Jennifer's, is that, uh, well, you know, it's a little too little too late to, to come into this uh, race because HBO is so far ahead. Mm -hmm. But in, in fact, I looked into it, and it's apparently, it's been five years in the making, this oh, series and just basically ran out of financing stuff like a year ago. I so it's a, it's a thing that they've been doing for quite some time. I think maybe they were trying to react to the Americans when they saw it on American TV. Anyway, because oh, that, that a, was yeah, the perception. Yeah, that, 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 I mean, that's fascinating because, you know, there's a CIA character in there. Jennifer, there was one character, Zharkov, who was fictional, right? Now, in, in the first episode, he's fascinating because he's this old Bolshevik um, loyalist who's telling everybody, do it for Mother Russia, do it for Lenin, for the spirit of Lenin at this, at this table. And they all cheer him on. And he says, we're going to seal off the city and nothing to see here. There's no problem. I guess I'm a bit partial to the idea that this was a bit propagandist because did they need to create this character to say this stuff when everybody had internalized this stuff anyway? Wouldn't it be more realistic to just show people making these catastrophic decisions because they live and breathe the system without the old man forcing them to to do it well that was a wonderful um that was a wonderful cameo character but i think it was important because he makes the point that the um the reactor factory the chernobyl plant is named after lenin um that the state is preeminent and that everybody has a duty to the state and if their duty is to keep quiet as he says um the people should just continue on with their work uh and their work as they see it is to cover up the fact that there's been the worst nuclear reaction uh reactor explosion um in the history of mankind 
Yeah, something that might be buried yeah, amid all of this, especially with the controversy. As we look at it, we look at people who are not happy with, with the show, those who consider it propagandist and so on. Dimitri, does it fully show the heroism of the soldiers, the reservists, the volunteers, the miners, and all of those who did their very best in order to stem the fallout and to stop the disaster from becoming worse? It, it's a long shot to say that something represents uh, a huge effort of 600,000 people fully within five episodes, obviously. But I think it was done in a pretty respectful manner. Uh, there were, of course, uh, elements, again, which were added for the kind of the Hollywood touch uh, to, uh, to the whole um, series. As, for example, the miners who were completely in the nude because it was so hot, that mm -hmm. is factually incorrect. Or the minister of um, industry, in person coming with two armed guards with Kalashnikovs to the miners to ask them slash order them to go and join the effort. Uh, I thought that this, this was this was a bit off, but it, it was it was it was fiction. This is Hollywood. This is not a documentary. OK, and good points. And whatever your views on, on the politics of this, it is utterly compelling viewing, really fascinating. And uh, it's it's almost hard to believe that this happened only 30 years ago um, uh, at this catastrophic level. Listen, uh, Dimitri and Jennifer, good to talk to both of you. I thank you very much for joining us on the Newsmakers. And that's all for this edition of the Newsmakers with me, Imran Garda. Check out more of our stories on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. Remember to like, follow, and subscribe. Next time, thousands in Sudan stay home from work, demanding an end to military rule. Will the country's security forces back down, or could the streets of Sudan see more bloodshed? Until then, thank you for watching. Bye-bye.